Hi library friends, I'm Miss Vivian and welcome to Storytime. For today's program, I have a story that takes place in another part of the world. With permission from Macmillan Publishers, I'm very happy to share with you Tuko and the Birds, A Tale from the Philippines, written by Shirley Climo and illustrated by Francisco X. Mora. A tale is a story that's shared shared among many families, but is told in different ways. So I hope you'll enjoy this story. The book starts off with an author's note. According to Filipino legend, a giant once hurled a huge rock into the sky. It fell like a space boulder into the Pacific Ocean and broke into bits. Some pieces sank beneath the waves, but 7,083 of them floated and became the Philippine Islands. The fable of Toko and the Birds has been told for many years. The Toke Gecko, a large lizard found throughout Southeast Asia, is called a Toko in the Philippines. Its name comes from the sound of its hoarse cry often as loud as the bark of a dog. Legend says that whenever a tuko swallows anything, it calls its name five times. Many Filipinos believe these geckos bring good luck and some children keep them as pets. The Philippine eagle is the largest of the 800 species of birds found in the Philippines today standing over three feet tall with a wingspan of almost eight feet. The eagle is the official symbol of the Republic of the Philippines. Although many people doubt the truth of the old fable, it is still a favorite tale. The storytellers simply nod their heads and say, Bahala na, whatever happens, happens. It's their way of pointing out that anything in the world is possible. Once on the Philippine island of Luzon, a little house stood all by itself on top of Mount Pinatubo. The walls were made of bamboo poles and the roof was thatched with palm or nipa leaves. The house perched on stilts above the mountainside watching over the bay and the city of Maidalad. Over the years, trees grew tall and hid the house from view. Wild gourd vines twisted over the steep mountain path and the hut was forgotten by all but the sharp-eyed birds. They flew to the hidden house to practice singing. Do we chirped the blue and white robin. Bertu, cooed the green pigeon. Grio, grio, chuckled the laughing thrush. A small varlet kept time by calling, tuk, tuk, tuk. Some birds hummed, some whistled. But Haribon, the eagle, was too large to squeeze inside with the others. He listened from his perch in the breadfruit tree outside the door. In the evenings, the breeze carried the bird songs down the mountainside. Hearing it, babies stopped crying, cats stopped washing, dogs stopped scratching fleas, and on the sandy bottom of the bay, a giant clam closed its shell. The men of Mainilad pulled in their fishing nets, the women put away their cooking pots, and the children stopped playing hide-and-seek. It's bedtime, they said. The birds are singing their goodnight songs. The birds sang until the sun disappeared in the sea. Then they flew up to the raptors and slept until the jungle fowl crowed at dawn. One moonlit night, the birds were suddenly awakened by an ear splitting sound. Tuku! 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 
tail feathers stood up straight. Birds popped into the air like shuttlecocks. The noise was louder than the bellow of a water buffalo. The little bamboo hut wobbled on his skinny stilt legs and nipa leaves swirled down from the roof. When everything was still again and it was quiet enough to hear a feather fall, the varlet piped. What was that? A volcano, declared the pigeon. I heard it rumble. An earthquake, said the thrush. I saw the roof shake. A typhoon, said the robin. I felt the wind blow. A monster, shrieked the mina. And there it is. Peering down from their perches, the bird saw something dreadful crouch by the door. The creature was the size of a young crocodile. Its head was broad, its tail long, and its legs were short and stubby. Yellow eyes bulged like a frog's, and from its pointy nose to its 20 toes, it was covered with orange spotted scales. What? What are you? quavered the pigeon. I told you my name. I told you five times, the creature snapped. I'm Tuko the gecko, and I've come to sing. With us? The birds look at one another in alarm. How did you find our house? I follow my nose, Tuko said. And your noise? He rolled his eyes. I may stay forever. Beaks dropped open, but not as much as a peep came out. Lost your voices? The lizard asked. Lucky for you, I still have mine. Stretching his mouth wide, he roared, to go, to go, to go, to go, to go. The eagle stuffed feathers into his ears, trying to block the dreadful sound. All night long, the little house trembled with Toko's cries. In the morning, the sleepless birds slumped on their roosts, plumes drooping and feathers frayed. Wasn't I grand? Toko asked. The gecko grinned at the birds, showing two rows of sharp teeth. I'll sing for you again after my nap. Then he crawled onto a sleeping mat on the floor and pulled a nipa leaf over his head. Harabon, the eagle eyed the sleeping lizard. The goal must go, he declared. Go where? asked Robin. To the swamp, Harabon replied, to sing with the frogs. But what if he doesn't want to? asked the worried Judge Fowl. The eagle stretched his head with a talon. We could give him a special goodbye present, he cried. Bugs and beetles, beetles and bugs, the parrot chanted loudly. That's what lizards like, sworn Harabon. But the palm frond had already began to twitch. From underneath, a hoarse voice shouted, Quiet, please. When Toko woke up that evening, he found a basket beside him. In it were two dozen squirming, wriggling, jumping, hopping, slithering, scuttling insects. Aha! The gecko cried in surprise. Snacks! They're your goodbye presents, said the robin. We think you will like the mangrove swamp bo mu below much better. I would never leave such nice neighbors as you, Toko protested. The swamp has a lot more bugs, the thrush pointed out. No, 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 the lizard barked, slapping his tail on the mat. The swamp is too damp. What if I get a sore throat? Then I couldn't sing or eat. Toko finished his cricket from the basket. Masarap, he said, delicious. The birds watched Toko's long tongue dart in, in and out, thwacking bugs as fast as lightning. Zap, zap. All gone, Toko grumbled, shaking the basket. I only swallowed three crickets, four locusts, five flies, three moths, eight mosquitoes, and a cockroach. Twenty-four in all, agreed the varlet. He had kept count. I always call five times after I eat anything, Toko boasted. So I must sing 120 times tonight. Please. Don't, begged the rice bird. Nothing is too much trouble for my friends, said the gecko. 
to go, to go, to go, to go. Then he roared his name 150 more times. The noise was so loud that it blew Harabon right out of the tree. Every night for a whole week, the gecko thundered his two-note tune. The weary birds, unable to sing or sleep, began to lose their feathers. The jungle fowl were so tired they couldn't even crow. The people of Mainilad were tired too. Without the birds' goodnight songs, no one knew when to go to bed. During the day, Toko chased insects across the walls and hung upside down by his sticky toes from the raptors, making such terrible faces that the smaller birds squawked and flew away. Now our nestlings just copy that lizard's horrible cry. They don't even try to sing our song, wailed the robin. If Toko won't go, then we will have to leave, sighed the, sighed the wagtail. Don't be hasty, said the horrible let me think. The eagle spent the morning brooding in the breadfruit tree. At noon, he pumped his wings and sailed into the sky. He circled over the island of Luzon until his keen eyes spied something dangling from a branch of a tall tree. It was the size and color of a coconut. Ah, exclaimed Harabon, a wasp nest. The eagle swooped down. Carefully, he snipped the hive from the branch with his strong beak. Very carefully, he flew back with it to Mount Pinatubo. Very, very carefully, he put it down outside the little house. From inside came to coast, noise, snores. Gising na, Harabon called. Wake up. The lizard poked his nose out the door. Do not, do not disturb, he scolded. Then he saw the wasp nest. Is that a coconut? It's much better than a coconut, Harbon answered. It's buzzing, Duco cried. Is something alive inside? See for yourself, said the eagle. With his sharp toenails, Duco ripped to open the hive. Out swarm hundreds of angry stinging wasps. Out flicked to go's tongue. Zap, zap, zap. The gecko swallowed the wasps so fast that not one of them had time to sting. In a few moments, the hive was empty, and the astonished birds heard the wasps buzzing inside the lizard. To go, to go, to go, to go, to go. Pick up the gecko patting his noisy stomach. Tasty, he told the eagle. Hi, groaned Harabon. Wasps must be your favorite food. Oh no, exclaimed Toko. I like rhinoceros beetles best. They're so tasty and chewy. Really, Harabon said with a sly smile. Perhaps I can find some for you. Now? Morning is the best time for beetle hunting, the eagle answered. Rhinoceros beetles for breakfast, cried Toko. Check that tree stump at sunrise tomorrow, said Harabon. He turned to the birds watching from the doorway. Just wait, he promised them. Harabon knew exactly what was needed and where to find it. A grove of special trees grew on the other side of the island and the eagle glided to a stop on one of them. It was a gita, a gum tree. The eagle pecked the trunk with its beak. Tuck, tuck, tuck. Sap oozed from the holes in the bark. Drop by drop, Harabon caught the milky liquid in a half a coconut shell. Plop, plop, plop. The sun was already setting before the shell was full. Flying slow, slowly, so as not to spill a drop, the eagle returned to Mount Pinatubo. There, by the light of the moon, Harabon quietly shaped the rubbery sap into five fat rhinoceros beetles. Meanwhile, inside the Nipa hut, the lizard noisily shouted his name. Tuku, 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 tuku. 
The eagle lined up his imitation beetles on the stump and eyed them doubtfully. They didn't look very real. Luckily, the greedy lizard never looks before he bites, said Herborn. He flapped up to his breadfruit tree to sleep. Tokoa's loud voice woke the eagle at dawn. Beetles! Beautiful beetles! Harbon saw the gecko squatting outside the bird's house, squinting at the stump. Rhinoceros beetles, he said, for your breakfast. The gecko dashed to the stump and popped the first beetle in his mouth. Tuku, he shouted. Tuku, he cried, cramming it in a second beetle. Tuku, he added for the third. Tuk! The gecko began struggling to swallow the fourth. They must be nice and chewy, said the eagle. Tuko pushed in the fifth beetle. He mumbled. Is something wrong? Harbone asked. The lizard couldn't answer. He couldn't even open his mouth. His tongue was stuck tight to his teeth with guitar gum. Tuko dug at his mouth with his right front foot. It stuck too. He dug with his left front foot and his toenails clung to his snout like flies to fly paper. He flopped on his back, pawing frantically at his nose with both hind feet, but the gluey gum caught them fast. Tuko whipped his tail against his jaw, trying to shake loose all four feet. Instead, he trapped his tail in the rubbery gum and rolled about on the ground like a hoop. Where are you going, my friend? said Harabon. Girl, Tuko growled. Swamp, did you say? asked the eagle. A fine idea. Hump, 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 huffed the furious lizard spinning in circles, faster and faster. You seem in a hurry, Harbon said. Shall I help? With one wing, the eagle gave the gecko a gentle push. Tuko bounced over the gourd vines and down the mountain path like an old soft tire. Flip-flop, flip-flop, flip-flop. Ba'alam, called Harbon after him. Goodbye. The commotion brought the birds from the house. What a shame, Harbon told them. You missed saying Ba'alam to Mr. Tuko. Goodbye, exclaimed the varlet. You mean he's gone? He suddenly decided to visit the swamp, said the eagle. Speechless, the birds stared at one another. Then altogether they threw back their heads, opened their beaks, and began to sing. That evening, the breeze once again carried the sound of bird song down the mountain. As always, everything and everyone stopped to listen. The people of Mindalad didn't ask why the birds were silent for weeks. Bahalana, they said, and went to bed. Tuko never told anyone what had taken place on Mount Punaturbo. When he was able to open his mouth once more, he was too embarrassed to say a word, but he couldn't forget the little bamboo hut with the nipa roof. Even today, the gecko stretches, even today the gecko searches for another house to practice his singing. And on moonlit nights, his voice can be heard calling, Tuku, 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 Tuku. And that's the end of Tuko and the Birds, A Tale from the Philippines, written by Shirley Climo and illustrated by Francisco X. Mora. Thank you, library friends. If you're interested in more tales from around the world, please visit our website at eglendalac.org. Thank you and take care.